get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Big thank you to Kevin Thompson for sparking the idea for this interview. Today, we have Perry Marshall, who's known for being the number one author and world's most quoted consultant on Google advertising and has helped over 100,000 advertisers save billions of dollars in AdWords. Now, we're not going to be talking about Google AdWords today, but maybe a little bit, actually. He's helped grow a tech company from 200000 to $4 million in sales that eventually was bought by a public company. And his works include The Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords book and 80-20 Sales and Marketing uh, and many more. I have it right here. It's actually fantastic. Um, read it cover to cover. It's great. Now, he's back to talk about his book, Evolution 2.0. Breaking the deadlock between Darwin and design. I never thought Perry, I would talk, be talking about this um, as an interview. But, you know, Perry is an engineer who spent, I was, you know, I couldn't believe this. You spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on AdWords for this cause alone on your journey to answer the question, does God exist? And every talk I notice when you give a talk, um, you start with prefacing that this topic is going to piss people off. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I wanted to start off. First of all, thank you for for joining me. It's great to be here, and um, and you know, just for the audience's benefit, when Jeremy researches a topic, like he goes deep. Um, he sent me his questions uh, a little bit ago, and like, okay, you know, you've got a seriously dedicated interview host here. And this is going to be rock awesome. Well, so, I have, thank you very much. That means a lot coming from you because you go deep as well. So my first question is obviously, what in the book pisses people off? Well, you know, evolution is maybe not quite as polarizing as abortion and gun control, but it's probably right up there. Right. Um, and, uh, it, and people... Uh, people feel threatened by this topic at an almost visceral level. They they just like you will you will just get this instinctive like no shut off not don't believe you you're an idiot you know you, you can get that from either side mm -hmm. and um and and so here's the truth this conversation will only piss you off if you have a cemented position that you are like clinging on to um, and you just think that everybody else is a nutcase. Um, and if, <laughs> if that's you, you may not like this conversation. However, if you're anywhere not in some really polarized extreme, and if you're the kind of person who suspects that there's more to the story than you've been told, or if you've ever had the feeling that neither side was really giving you the whole story, then you'll probably love this conversation. I, I had a bunch of homeschool kids uh, come to a presentation a few months ago. I watched that, yeah. There was there was all of these parents just, just before, there was like a flurry of emails like, hey, what, what's this guy going to do? You know, and and then we had the meeting. I talked for an hour and a half, yeah. and and what you can't see from the video because it is on YouTube yeah. is half the people stayed there for two more hours and hammered me with questions. And it wasn't mean and nasty hammering. It was like, oh my word! Like I've never heard of this stuff before. Like wow, uh, you know what have I been missing? And 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 it went really deep. And it went into stuff like I could have never predicted where that conversation was going to go. Yeah. And people were absolutely fascinated. And very few people were offended. And so if, if you just – if you know that the world is a little more amazing and mysterious than maybe you had been told, then right. we're in for a great ride. So give me an example. What was – the some of the profound questions people are asking or the depth that you went into that you didn't expect 
Well, so for example, a lady at the end, you'll understand this better as Jeremy um, goes in. Some Somebody asked me a question about, um, about some kid having all of these problems, even though, he, uh, you know, as far as that guy could tell, he was raised in a really good home and he didn't have any traumas. And he goes, but, but I know that his grandmother or his mother, one of the two, uh, experienced some really horrible abuse. And I had brought up epigenetics, uh, which is a way that, that things get passed on from parents to kids. Well, it turns out there actually is um, significant evidence now that both traumas as well as environmental things and mm -hmm. adaptations that parents have had to deal with in the environment do get passed on to children. Mm -hmm. In fact, epigenetics is a very hot topic. And so, like, so I guess the, the, the short version is, is the whole world of evolutionary biology is in a tremendous reorganization right now. And if, if you're the kind of person where the topic felt threatening to you 10 years ago or some other time when you got into an argument with somebody, I'm just going to assure you there's a whole bunch of stuff that never got included in those previous conversations, which might completely change the way that you see this. And like, I totally know it's weird. Like, I'm like, how did I end up becoming the author of an evolution? <laughs> like, uh, this is a weird thing. You know, I mean, people who know what I do, like, why are you off doing that? But the thing is, is like, this is the biggest untold story in the history of science. And, and I am not exaggerating. This is so major. And it, it does, it's not just about science, okay? It, it speaks to how we live. It mm -hmm. speaks to how we treat the environment. It speaks to how we practice medicine. And it speaks philosophically because there's a lot of people out there trying to make you think that science means that the world is a meaningless, purposeless place. And I'm here to tell you that ain't so. Yeah. And so, um, so, you know, buckle up. We'll get into why you wrote Evolution 2.0. You know, from the intro, it seems strange, you know, but once we get into it, it's not as much. And it starts going, you know, I have a couple of fun facts, Perry, about you. One is you grew up as a pastor's son. And yes. so what was it like? Um, it was a lot of pressure. Um, you know, where, where I grew up, they, it was pretty heavy handed and, you know, like leaders in the church were expected their, their kids need to be in line and not getting in trouble. Right. Well, Jeremy, I'm an entrepreneur. Now, like, what do we all know about, you know, all of us, Right. We're troublemakers, we're loud mouths, we're nonconformists, we're always making messes, you know. So there was definitely some skinning of knees and some scuff marks, uh, and it, you know, and it's all good. It all turns out good, but it's an interesting fishbowl to live in. Yeah, uh, growing up. So sure. yeah. So what were you like? What was Perry? Growing up, like what I can't imagine you actually getting into that much trouble. What kind of trouble did you get into? Well, I'm not. Well, the worst trouble I ever got to into was a fist fight with somebody at school. Right. Which you know, like when my dad found out of it, he's like, "Perry, this could like get me fired." Um, but you know, but I was, I was. I was always very opinionated. I was always disruptive in class. I was always seeking attention. I was always changing the subject, uh, disrupting the discussion. Um, and, you know, like way too much energy and a little what we would now probably label as ADHD or something. Right. right? I mean, th probably most people who are listening to you, like, like Jeremy, you, you know, you have a show where the topics are like, the, yeah, they, there's a theme, but they're all over the place, right. right? And there's a certain kind of person that just needs that stimulation. Like right. they could they could drive in their car, they could listen to your podcast, and like the hour just completely disappears. Time goes away because the brain cells are getting all this happy juice from all this information, right? Yeah. Well, 
right? So that's our world. What if you got to sit in third grade and the teacher is droning on about, right? Like it's awful. Like somebody get me out of here. So, you know. Well, what's interesting, Perry, too, though, is your brother took a bit of a different path from you. So how was he? Tell me about your relationship with him and then what he went on to do that influenced this book sort of too. That's that's where the story starts. Yeah. So 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 first of all, you know, we, we grew up in this super, super conservative environment where they kind of like had all the exact answers and it was all mapped out and and you know, I just kind of started drifting uh, you know, a little to the left. I mean, we were like just to the right of Attila the Hun back then, but you know, I was like, I think the world is a little squishier than this and I think you know, I think there's more answers than what I'm getting here. Right. And I certainly wasn't ditching it, but I was just holding it more with an open hand. Right. My brother, Brian, however, he, he was like on the party line, you know, and, and he, he went to a very conservative seminary, which was, you know, even more of the same. And, and then he gets out of school and he goes to China to be a missionary and he's teaching English and he's doing mission work on the side. And he's like, you know, he's like the altar boy of the family, you know? Mm. Well, not too long after he gets to China, like all these questions start popping up, you know, it's almost like, you know, if you push on the universe over here, it starts popping out over here. Like he was experiencing this and, um, and, and, and it's like more questions and more questions and more questions. And let me tell you, he is really sharp. Plus, he's like one of the sharpest, most penetrating people I know anywhere. And I mean, I know a lot of sharp people. You yeah. know what I do. Yeah. And our profession attracts the brightest. Let's, let's understand that, right? The marketing profession attracts all kinds of brilliant people like maybe the smartest chiropractors, for example, right? Exactly. It's not the dumb ones, it's the smart ones <laughs> that, that come, right? And, and Brian is as smart as any of those guys, and, and Brian is really asking hard questions, yeah. and he's asking good questions, he's asking about faith and God and scripture and all this kind of stuff. You know, and a lot of these questions are dragging me in deep, and mm. like I don't know all the answers, and, um, and he really starts kind of unhinging from where he had come from. And this is, I am finding this to be unsettling. Like, What was it about hey, China that made him question all this stuff? Um, he was no longer in, environ, in a tightly knit environment where they could control the questions he asked mm -hmm. or like kind of knock him back in line. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I would describe the environment that he was in as a very controlling environment and one that didn't really encourage curiosity. It was like, hey, you know, we've got it all figured out. And he's like, you know, I don't think they have it all figured out. In fact, hey, wait a minute. Like, guess what? Like, he's got the Internet. You're in China and you got an Internet connection, right? And you have however many hours a day to go do whatever, right? Well, what's going to stop you from looking around like, hey, what, you know, I spent the last six weeks on the Internet. And guess what? Uh, the world isn't 6,000 years old. There's a, right. These kinds of things. Now, I like, yeah, Brian, I know the world isn't 6,000 years old. Like I figured that out a long time ago, you know, it, but there's more and there's more and there's more and there's more. And pretty soon, like he is just off in the weeds. And he's actually kind of dragging me with him. He's asking really smart questions. And, and um, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I know all these textbook ans answers, but he's not asking textbook questions anymore. Yeah, what were some okay. of the hard and good questions that well, stick out that he was asking? Well, I'll just, I'll just give you a few. Yeah. Um, one of them was, hey, Perry, I've read the... I've studied Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, and I've studied the Bible back, forth, upside down. He goes, it doesn't say anywhere that the miracles are going to go away after the disciples go away. It doesn't say that anywhere. So where's the miracles? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, let me check with my sales manager. <laughs> no, I don't have time to get into that one. 
Okay, right. but that was out there. Yeah, what else? And there was yeah. all there was all these like coming. Christian theological yeah. questions and well, what about the inspiration of the Bible? And what about the inerrancy of the Bible? And what about those tomb stories that don't exactly match? And I'm like, just like tons of stuff. And, and I found myself like sort of backing up and, and going to where I felt most comfortable, which was science. Right. And I go, and it was almost like a last straw kind of a question, like, Brian, you don't honestly think that the hand at the end of your arm is like the result of a series of accidents, do you? Well, he was ready for that question, too. What and he that, gave yeah. you me kind of the standard Darwinist answer. Now, and he expected me to take him seriously. Well... Here's what, here's what I knew. I knew that my engineer intuition ha could not fathom how that could be true. But I also knew something else. I knew that most biologists would agree with him, not me. Hmm. And I knew I have an electrical engineering degree, and there's some stuff in electrical engineering that is totally mind-bending. Okay? You would never... like. Most people would never, ever, even remotely come up with the idea that you would use imaginary numbers from college algebra to analyze wave equations, okay? So, and I'm like, I don't have a biology degree. There's a bunch of stuff I don't know. And if most biologists agree with him, not me, then maybe I'm wrong about, like, all of that. Why would they agree and, with him and not you, though? Because I already knew that most biologists do believe in some form of evolution, and I didn't. Mm. Um, and I knew that what he was telling me was like standard textbook stuff, and that I could give him some like quick and dirty answer about entropy. But I knew, I just knew, if I didn't get down to the core principle of this thing, I didn't know. And I was either like taking this guy's word for it or else this other guy's word for it. And I knew in my heart that that wasn't good enough. And, and so I said, you know what? I am going to get to the bottom of this. I am going to find out because I know what it is like to get to the bedrock of a profession. I know what it is like to get to the bedrock of I understand the core principle, like the really deep principle about how something works and I can figure it out from first principles and not just like look up the answer in a book and I can know that I know that I know because I really got to the core. Uh, I'm gonna get to the core of this thing. Yeah. And I kind of leapt into the void. And, and because he was, he was giving me all these other questions and I didn't really have answers for them, I kind of decided, you know what? I'm gonna let my science background answer this question for me because I know that I know that I know certain things. Mm -hmm. And so into the void I go. And it was really scary. I mean, it really was. It was like, I don't know where I'm going to end up right. when I'm done with all of this. I just can't, I can't see, but you know what? Here we go. Yeah. And, and you know what, when you talk about that is you don't know where you're going to end up, but where do you even start? And I didn't know where to start either. Yeah. But what I, here's what I did. I said, all right, so I can read in any textbook that Darwinian evolution says that random mutations of DNA produce genetic changes which are sorted by natural selection to produce new species. I'm like, well, okay, natural selection, that's like, you know, we all know, we all know what that works, you know, if you've ever watched... Uh, Oh, the World Series, for example, you know how natural selection works. So there's nothing mysterious about that. Um, so what about these random mutations? Okay. Now, and I, and I had a question very early on. It was like, okay, if all you got to do is like turn the mutation crank and just, you know, and just keep this thing running, and it's just inevitably and naturally going to make things better and better and better. Why didn't they ever teach me this in engineering school? 
Do the biologists know something the engineers don't? Or do the engineers know something the biologists don't? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, all right, random mutations, DNA. DNA mutations, random mutations, what would that? You get accidental copying errors. And so, all right, I guess I better look at DNA mutations. And so I started studying DNA mutations. And um, well, I ought to be able to find experiments where they accelerated the mutations and they got evolution to happen. That ought to be in there somewhere. And there ought to be some principle, like almost like some mathematical principle where I can plug in this mutation idea and see what would come out. And, um, and so, so, so there's a couple things that I discovered actually fairly fast. Yeah. And, and keep in mind, I'm like, I keep having to rein myself in and bring it back to the central question because I can go read this website or this book and it'll pull me to the left. I could read this one and pull me to the right. And I was just, I was just flipping, flapping and flopping like back and forth right. because because these guys are convincing, but these guys are convincing, except these guys also sound like zealots, and these guys sound like zealots. And, and pretty soon I'm like, I really need to read some scientific papers. Fortunately, I have an electrical engineering degree that hugely helps when you want to read scientific literature. So I found two things. Number one, I found that there were decades of experiments with fruit flies where they would bombard them with radiation, which would make random mutations. That makes perfect sense, right? And they and it works, like they do make mutations. And they figure, okay, if we if we like turn the radiation dial just right, if we get this just right, we ought to get accelerated fruit fly evolution. And right. you know what? Yeah. Didn't work. It didn't work on fruit flies, it didn't work on didn't work on moths, like there's all kinds of stuff. Didn't work. You know what it got? It got what an engineer would expect, which is birth defects. Okay, they got every kind of birth defect you could imagine. They had, you know, legs growing out of their heads. Okay, which is really interesting. If you want to go stop and think about that, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna go into it. But stop and think. How does a leg start growing out of your head all of a sudden? Well. Um, but I had a, it's like, okay, okay, how do I make sense of this? I'm still looking for the principle. I got to the principle and here's what it was. I was reading about DNA and it was, it was talking about, about the coding being in layers. And all of a sudden I had this giant epiphany because in 2002, I wrote an ethernet book hmm. and it was all about how the ones and the zeros go back and forth. Okay. And the thing, you know, it's like regular people would never even think about this, but all of your routers and your cell phones and your computers, they have multiple, multiple, multiple stages of error detection and error correction. Because when you're driving down the highway and you're talking on the cell phone or you're surfing the web on your iPad or any, whatever you're doing, especially when all these things are moving around you, there are so many errors and so many corruptions of the signal. And all of that stuff, especially now as, 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 as mature as those technologies are, there is an incredible amount of, please resend that information. Okay, checked it, it's exactly right. It's extremely clever how they make sure it's all, and, and may, you know, most of the time our cell phone calls don't drop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and it's, it's just, and the GPS works and it's just amazing. But the error correction is absolutely critical to this. And what I realize is, wait a minute. Oh my word, I get it. The digital information in DNA is conceptually, like mathematically, it's the same set of problems as an Ethernet cable or a Wi-Fi network. It's the same exact issue. You have a packet of data, it has to get transmitted and it has to get decoded, it has to get encoded. Encoding, decoding, transmission, error correction, it's exactly the same. And Jeremy, I mean it's exactly the same from a mathematical point of view. It's identical. DNA is code. 
okay? Yeah. The reason the fruit flies had, had legs growing out of their heads was they had scrambled the code with that radiation and all you got was de-evolution, hmm. okay? And, and, and here's the thing, any communication engineer knows this. If, like, if even the very first cell did not have error detection and correction, the whole thing would eventually die. Right. Okay. But, and so it's like, so like the really simple answer from what I just told you would suggest, oh, evolution's not true. Somebody designed this and, um, and they would have had to have designed it in advance and all the other codes are designed. DNA is the only code that we know of that's not designed. We don't know where it came from. Therefore, DNA is designed. Therefore, some kind of creationism or some kind of intelligent design is true. End of story. Mm -hmm. But that's not the end of the story. Right. Okay. That would have only been the first slice. Now, by the way, everything I told you is true. It's like digitally one and zero, empirically demonstrably true. It's rigorously true. But but it's not even the interesting part of the story, okay? So, part of, part of what I, I, I needed to do for myself in order to sort this out was this. Brian, at some point, decided I'm, I'm done arguing with Perry, <laughs> okay? And I am, I am so tenacious, I am a bulldog, and I will get to the bottom of things. And, you know, if we're in a disagreement and I absolutely know I'm right. And, and by the way, I really pick my battles. Okay. Um, you know, I, I am not, I am not going to get in an argument about the Cubs versus the White Sox. I couldn't care less. Right. But I needed a sparring partner. And I needed somebody to call me out of my BS. And I had a couple of these websites. And especially back then, web traffic was really cheap. It's like 10 times as expensive now as it was then. And I said, you know what? I'm going to put an autoresponder series together, and I'm going to talk about this DNA. <laughs> I love this, thing. Perry. I love it. Okay? You, yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put up a sign-up page, and I am going to drive traffic with Google Ads, and, and, and I'm going to get all... People are going to sign up, and when they reply to these emails, I'm going to I'm going to get the emails, and I am not going to to run away from any legitimate objection or argument that somebody brings to me. And I drove millions of visitors to this website. Yeah, I think um, I heard you say over five million views. Yeah, so something like that. Yeah, 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 and and I got like. I had um, more than 150,000 people sign up on that email list, and I had a, another email list that, that I won't get into, and it was kind of similar. And, 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 and I had people coming at me from every direction. I mean, and I got every kind of person you can imagine, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jews, agnostics, cynics, skeptics. I mean, you know, I, everything you can imagine. Um, and, and, and it was like, I am going, I'm, I'm going to pound on this thing and I'm going to pound on this thing until I get to the truth. And so, you know, 80 or 90% of the time, these people would be a waste of time, but like, you know, like five or 10% of the time I would be getting in a discussion with a very smart person who knew stuff and, and this started growing and, and, and I decided, and, and here, so here's what happened. So that first thing I said where, well, you know, D DNA is a code and codes are designed and there clearly is, is an inference to design and biology simply from information theory, which is a whole subject that, you know. But, okay, on the other hand, boy, you know, when I look at all of these different papers and books and evidence and everything, it still looks like evolution happened. Okay? Like, this doesn't make me comfortable, uh, 
but like I am gonna I told myself I'm gonna follow this thing wherever it leads and I I just kept like going down the rabbit hole and going down the rabbit hole and it was in and, and I couldn't figure it out it was like okay we've got error detection we got error correction we've got you know there's none of these random mutations would never do what the Darwinists say they would do yet on the other hand you know like you've got you've got I go to the whale museum in Boston and I see a whale skeleton and it's got these miniature whale feet in the middle of its belly. They're not even on the outside. It's like they're folded up and shrunken down. And I'm like, that wouldn't be that way if some designer just like beamed that whale into the ocean like Star Trek. Right. Why are those bones in there? Right. They are clearly remnants of some ancestor, but hang on a second. They're shrunken down. They're down to scale. That's not accidental. That's actually a really impressive engineering feature. Like, oh, you know, just in case we need these someday, we just got this dialed down. I'm like, if I was a software engineer and I had to program that to happen, like, that would be no mean feat. Right. Are, Jeremy, are you starting to get a flavor of like, hey, you know, there's a whole nother layer of subtlety to this thing. Yeah. I mean, at this point, I want to go back. So who is your ideal person to debate with? So you, at this point, you're getting tons of people coming at you via email. Also, probably different family and friends. Who's your ideal person to debate with? You mean then? Yeah, then and now. Well, you know, <laughs> it depends on what the goal is, okay? Yeah. So, like, first of all, I... I found something really peculiar, which was like, I could open an email, read the first sentence, and there was a certain kind of person that just stood out compared to all the other ones. Right, right. Okay. So pretty much everybody, most people were at least civil. Yeah. I'm just thinking like you're 80, 20 person. I'm thinking who's the, who's the 20%? Like, is there a certain demographic or profession or that you found that that person, this is the person I want to kind of solidify my, not arguments, but my thoughts with. Well, okay. So really there's, there's kind of two, there's two different animals here. Yeah. So one of them was the so-called new atheists. Okay. And these guys, you could see them coming a mile away. They would come unglued and they would just like go crazy. And it was like, it was like some, it was like somebody flipped some switch with these people and they are just rabid maniac. Okay. And it was, it was like, like, whoa. There is something really weird going on with these people, and it's kind of abnormal. Yeah. Okay? Like, seriously. And you see this. Like, you could go to, like, any big newspaper or something. Like, go to the UK Guardian or something, and there's a religion article. And some flaming Richard Dawkins fans is sitting there just insulting all those stupid idiots and their religion, okay? It was really peculiar, okay? Now... This is not like the ideal person to learn from. Right. However, if you're if you're trying to really nail down the part of biology that has that they, that people have gotten wrong, they've all got a bullseye in their head because they have all bought into a version of evolution that is emphatically demonstrably not true. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it was like, I've got to take this out because, because it's the exact thing. The exact thing that I found was wrong is mm. the same thing that makes them think they're right. Mm -hmm. And it's that random accidental mutation part of the equation. No, it's not driven by random mutations. That will get you nothing but extinction and death. Okay, right. and what's really going on is cells are re-engineering their DNA, which brings me to the second group, which which was very interesting. So, um, so I found this contingent in the scientific literature that 
Um, you could call it post-Darwinian evolution. You could call it the third way. You could call it a lot of things. I call it evolution 2.0. Right. But it was a group of people that had done all kinds of fascinating experiments where they showed that organisms evolve in real time in response to what's going on in their environment mm -hmm. and, um, and that it is not random or accidental or frankly even really Darwinian. Um, and it starts with a lady named Barbara McClintock. And Barbara McClintock, in my opinion, was a greater scientist than Darwin. Now, I, some people are not going to like this. I actually have to give Darwin some credit. Okay? He was right about some things. Okay? In the broadest generalities, the, the overall kind of tech, the, the overall outline of his theory is correct. Okay, but he didn't actually explain anything. He made an observation. Right. But he never actually understood how or why you get a new species. What Barbara McClintock did was really interesting. How did you come even come across Barbara McClintock? Some guy I knew who was an engineer and who was into this stuff yeah. sent me a paper by James Shapiro. Yeah. And I read Shapiro's paper. I'm like, whoa, where have these people been all my life? How come I'm not hearing anything about this? I mean, it was like buried. Okay. Yeah. So here's what McClintock did. McClintock did radiation experiments too, but she approached them like a hacker. She didn't just bombard them. So it's like, okay, if you were trying to hack passwords or something, you know, some people would just, well, you know, let's just type some random numbers into the ATM. Okay, well, that's kind of doomed, okay? Right. Like, you're going to have to try all 10,000 combinations and, like, you know, the police are going to show up before you get there. Okay? Um, what McClintock did was she had this very meticulous knowledge of, corn um, genetics and she used radiation and she would damage chromosomes in very calculated ways and she basically threw the plant a curveball and said what happens if I do this and then she engineered this experiment very particularly and then the plant threw a curveball right back at her and what happened was she damaged a chromosome so that the plant couldn't reproduce and basically some of the address labels you could say got shuffled around and lost. And the plant is sitting there going through reproduce, reproductive cycles trying to reproduce and trying to fix this instability. And what it ended up doing is taking genetic material from another part of the chromosome and moving it around and she literally saw these genes moving around and then the plant fixed the problem and it started reproducing. Right. And this would be like ripping a page out of a novel and saying, hey, Jeremy, why don't you fill in the missing page? Go read everything before and after it and reconstruct the missing page. And the plant did it. Right. How does that work? Right. Okay. Now, she did this in 1944. And in uh, 1951, she'd done like seven years of research, and she goes and presents it to all her colleagues. And they looked at her like she was from Mars. They're like, plants can't do that. Are you crazy? Some of, Half of them laughed at her, and the other half were mad. And she got like zero reception from these people. Yeah. And uh, she realized that uh, trying to convince all these colleagues was futile. And so she pretty much went quiet about what she was doing for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. But then in the 70s, all these other researchers started confirming that this is true. In 1968, James Shapiro demonstrated that bacteria rearranged their own DNA. And then 
Well, she won a Nobel Prize in 1983 for this, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, what did she really do? Well, what she really did was she showed that organisms are in charge of their own evolution. Now, that is really mind-bending if, if you stop to think about it. Like, okay, so the DNA builds the cell, and then the cell modifies the DNA, and then that makes a different cell. <laughs> I mean, it's almost M.C. Escher-like. Right. Okay? And, like, we don't know how to write computer programs that do this kind of stuff. Like, oh my god. They're goodness. probably trying with the artificial intelligence. Of course right? they yeah, are. Yeah. Like, if you ever heard of Stuxnet, you go yeah. look that up. Yeah. Right? Like, primitive versions of this are starting to exist. Yeah. But I mean, obviously, these corn plants are like way. So it turns out that a cell can do more programming in 12 minutes than a team of software engineers can do in 12 weeks. Okay. So McClintock was the first human being to observe real-time evolution happening on the spot, under the microscope, right. and actually figure out what had gone on. But meanwhile, so notice it took 40 years for her to get a Nobel Prize for this. Right. Meanwhile, at the same time that her colleagues were laughing at her in the 40s, um, a bunch of guys were putting together the Neo-Darwinian Synthesis which was actually worse than what Darwin had to begin with. It was a step backwards, not a step forwards. And, and they assumed, starting in the 30s and 40s, it became dogma that evolution is random. It's not purposeless. It, it, it is purposeless. It's not goal-driven. Um, Children do not inherit acquired traits from their parents. And information only flows from DNA to the cell, never the other way. All of this became dogma. In fact, that last part was called Crick's, Francis Crick's central dogma. Hmm. The central dogma of biology was information never flows from the cell to DNA. It only flows from DNA to, to the cell. Mm -hmm. That is wrong. It flows both ways. That M.C. Escher staircase is true. So the novel can fill in its missing page. So you discover this. You're reading James Shapiro, McClintock. So you read this. Blows your mind a little bit. So what? Yeah. What do you do next? What's the conclusion that you you take from that, and and where do you take it from there? Well, so I found that there was there's an entire genre of literature and research, and I'm talking thousands of experiments and thousands of papers, where if all of a sudden you change these assumptions, first of all, there like no sane scientist could argue that what I'm saying is true. It's very established. Okay, so I call it the Swiss Army knife of evolution. Transposition, horizontal gene transfer, epigenetics, hybridization, symbiogenesis, that there are these five major mechanisms of evolution and these are how cells rewrite their own code. This is how organisms adapt. And so I just started going deeper and deeper and deeper and piecing this all together. And I'm going, how come, how come you can't find this unless you know what you're looking for it? How come nobody's talking about this? And, and I found really glaring omissions. So hmm. if you go to the bookstore and you buy books by Richard Dawkins, Jerry Coyne, Bill Nye, all these famous evolutionists, they don't tell you anything about this stuff. Why do you think? Or if, or if they do, briefly mention and then they move on. And basically, they've been telling you the same dumb, wrong story for the last 50 years. And they just recycle it and recycle it and recycle it. Like the latest Bill Nye book is like a throwback to the 1970s. It doesn't tell you anything new. It doesn't tell you anything interesting. And a person reading that book and closing it and going, that was a great book, 
they might as well have eaten a plastic bag and thought it was a ham sandwich. <laughs> okay? And it is scientific larceny. It is demonstrably wrong. Nobody has ever demonstrated that random mutations give you evolution. Nobody. You couldn't even prove it if you tried for reasons I won't go into. You can read them in my book. On the other hand, there's these systematic things and you can see, you can generate new species in the lab. There's certain things you can do and you will get, you get these changes. The fact is like, all this genetic engineering that goes on now and the genetically modified foods and, and the bio, like all the, all the biomedical stuff that right. they're doing and gene therapy, all of this is, they don't sit there with tweezers or razor blades and splice DNA like, like it was analog tapes. They, they stimulate viruses, bacteria, and cells to do the rearranging that they want them to do. And mostly the cells are, are doing it smarter, like the cells know what they're doing and the scientists don't. And that's how we get all this stuff. Right. This, is why, this is why no sane biologist can argue with it. It's, cells have already been doing the same genetic engineering that, that we're fumbling around with. They've been doing it for millions of years, and this is why we're here, okay? But if you look at it from a software engineering point of view, cells are vastly smarter than we are, at least in a certain sense. Right. I mean, maybe they're like savants, or maybe they're autistic or something. Like, I don't know how to describe it. But this is so amazing. And, but like the atheist crowd, because they read all the evolution books in the bookstore, they're not, they're not telling you this. But then you go to the creationist Darwinist side, they're not, or evolu the creationist intelligent design side, they're not telling you either. Okay, so you got the extreme creationists like Ken Ham, who is frankly just embarrassing. I mean, I'm a Christian. I think, okay, Ken Ham has done more to damage science and the credibility of Christians than anybody alive. Hmm. Okay, you know, he's got his creationist museum and like, oh, it's, it's awful. Now, don't get me wrong, those guys actually do have some useful information and they have useful perspectives about certain things. They are right about certain things. Um, one of the books that, that really got me oriented early on was a book called In the Beginning Was Information by Werner Gitt, which is an excellent book. And Werner Gitt is a old school young earth creationist, okay? However, so I have to give them some credit. They are right about some things. Also, for that matter, the atheists are right about some things. But neither side is telling you more than like a fourth of the story. The, the, the creationists are sitting there going, no, evolution's a hoax. I mean, there's some people that go so far to say is that like God buried all those fossils just to fool us or something. I mean, you literally will find people saying this, which like, oh my goodness. Um, so, but because they think evolution is a hoax, because they think evolution equals atheism, they're just sitting there trying to fight against evolution. Meanwhile, both, both sides are missing the biggest untold story ever. And like there's a bunch of scientists, not just like three or four, okay? There's a website called the thethirdwayofevolution.com and you can go and it's all these scientists that are publicly saying, we do not agree with the creationists and we do not agree with the old school Darwinists. We need a new synthesis. We need a new theory. The old theories are wrong in so many ways. And we're really trying to figure this out. And this was who I really latched onto. Mm -hmm. And it was so fascinating. What I found was all of the stuff that you do in engineering, all the stuff we do in business, all the stuff we do in Google AdWords, all the stuff we do in online marketing, it's accelerated live purposeful intentional evolution experiments is what it is. Only 
organisms do them better than we do. So we can go learn from the organisms. So what do yeah, atheists that's... what do atheists say that's right? You said the the create you know the creationists say certain things. Okay, so the atheists are correct, as far as I can tell, that life did evolve from a single cell. Um, you know, that humans have primate ancestors that, you know, that that the, you know, there's this evolutionary tree of life. Now you can debate how the tree should be put together, but I agree, yes, there's a tree of life. Um, I, I, I agree that common descent is, is correct. But here's the thing. They all think this happens by accident. No. No, 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 no. It does not happen by accident. It would never happen by accident. My original intuition as an engineer was correct. That would violate information entropy. No, actually what happens is cells know how to reduce information entropy. Cells create new information. Now, how they do this, I mean, that gets you into like, well, what is consciousness? And, that, you know, right. you know, it, and pr pretty soon you're in over your head in, in philosophical questions, but I can absolutely assure you, you can watch them do what they do. And the, there's no question that they do it. So there you go. So tell me this, Perry, in beginning stages of research till now, what has changed with your thinking, your thought process? Well, you know what I like to say is Darwinists underestimate nature and creationists underestimate God. Hmm. Both sides from within their view are shutting down information that makes them uncomfortable. And so they're just in denial and they're stopping. And what I found was that even when you violently disagree with somebody, there is almost always a nugget of truth that they have that you lack. Mm -hmm. And you will not solve the deadlock between the two sides until the one side, I don't care which side it is, one side goes to the other side, love their enemy, and find something that's true that they were in denial about, and then all of a sudden, maybe there's not a disagreement anymore. Did and, anything else change in your thought process or confirmed from the beginning till, till the end of your research and book? I mean, it never ends, so to speak. Well, well so... I had to expand my conception of God. How so? What do you mean? Yeah. Well, so, Jeremy, if, um, so you, you, back in the day, you, you used DOS, right? DOS operating system, C colon, DIR, you know, run setup.exe. Okay, so imagine that DOS evolved into Windows in 35 years and no human programmers in Redmond, Washington ever touched it. Let's just say the original program was innately capable of adapting and generating a web browser and generating a Windows desktop and figuring out what to do with a mouse and figuring out what to do with an internet connection. Imagine that DOS made all these adaptations by itself. Right. And DOS engineered its own virus protection continuously all the time. Didn't even need downloads. That'd be pretty would, remarkable, yeah. Would you be impressed with Bill Gates like more than you are now? <laughs> like, dude, how did you write software like that? Right. Well, that's how a person who believes in God should think about evolution. 
Okay. And frankly, a person who doesn't believe in God is probably going to want to change the subject because the fact is, is we are further from getting rid of God than we were 150 years ago when people thought Darwin got rid of God. It's like, oh, well, yeah, yeah. Not only does one cell build an ecosystem and then evolve an, a zebra to live in the ecosystem, but, you know, then the zebra could turn into something else if it needs to, right? Yeah. Like, I mean... I'm going to ask a question, Perry. This is, you know, not on my list or or thought press, but it's leading me, (laughs) leading me. So um, where do you think, take me back to the origin of life. I mean, you can't really take me back there. You said the single cell organism. What do you, what is your theory on that and the origin? Well, so there is no such thing as a theory of origin of life that properly qualifies as science based on any reasonable definition of science. Okay. Uh, to put it more bluntly, we have no freaking clue. Right. I'm okay. just asking what you think. Yeah. I mean, well, that, right. yeah. Well, I just got to say that. Right. Okay. Because, you know, people tell like, well, there was a warm pond and a lightning right. strike. <laughs> right. Because you have on one side, right, the, the warm pond, prebiotic soup, lightning strikes, there's an amoeba or whatever forms, and that's the start of, of life. And then the other side is, you know, God puts Adam and Eve um, right. or Adam and, you know, and, and so on. So I'm just wondering, yeah, I'm, we can't go back there and really prove anything, but well, I, so I, really, I'm talking to you, so I'm asking you, and, and your thought process is leading me to that question, so I'm going with it. So yeah. I... I, I give you two possibilities yeah. that that are reasonable from what we know. Yeah. Either A, it literally was a miraculous instant of true blue divine spark engineering. Okay. And, you know, I think that is actually a perfectly rational interpretation of the data that we have right so when you say design spark engineering you mean there is a higher power that basically all the ingredients are there but they had their hand in designing that initial whatever cell came about and you know call it ridiculous or call it perfectly fine but i that that is a completely logical interpretation of everything we know Mm -hmm. or right or or there is a principle of self-organization and even consciousness in physics that we do not understand. Okay? And that is also a perfectly reasonable response to this question, this riddle that we're looking at. Right. Okay? Right. Warm pond lightning strike is nowhere, that is not any kind of an answer, okay? And I've never seen an origin of life theory that I think is reasonable. Um, but, But this gets me to a really, really important point, okay? And, and here's what it is. So... I'm, I'm talking to my brother, you know, we would, we've been talking about this ever since, right? Okay. And he loves, he loves this project, by the way, okay? Yeah, I'm sure. He's an agnostic, he's still sorting things out, but he loves this project. He thinks it's great. And, you know, I, I, I made him famous, I guess, right? Yes. Well, he goes, Perry, yeah, great. You know, DNA is designed, all codes are designed. So what do you want, what do you want all these scientists to do? Just like throw up their arms and go have a three martini lunch and say, gee, I guess we can't solve this. Like, come on, Perry. Like, really? You expect them to do that? Like, what do you think their job is? Now, it took a while for this to sink in. Yeah. Because because I kind of had this idea. Yeah, you know, those arrogant scientists, they're just trying to deny God. Now, actually, they're trying to get research grants and keep their jobs. 
<laughs> like, give them some credit. Like, right. this is not a bad thing. We want scientists working on stuff. We right. want them trying to figure this out. Yeah. And here's what I realized. Yeah. Anytime you say, hey, you see that one little thing? God did that. Well, science just kind of stops. Like, you need a conception of God that does not compete with science. And I realized, you know, God does not compete with science. There's no reason for God to compete with science. That the only way for us to drive this forward is to assume that this is solvable. Mm -hmm. Now, why, if you believe in God, why would you want to believe that? Let me give you a reason why you'd want to believe that. What if God designed the universe to teach us as much as possible? Okay, if God beamed zebras out of the sky, out of the savannah like Star Trek, and the, and the, and the zebra went, and then it was there, could you learn anything about how to build a zebra? Sure, yeah. No, you could dissect it. Well, I mean dissect it, yeah. You could dissect it, but you wouldn't learn anything about how to build one. On the other hand, what, what the universe starts from first principles and that if you think, discover all the principles that you can reconstruct the whole thing, wouldn't that give you a whole bunch of wisdom? Wouldn't get a whole bunch of knowledge? Wouldn't it give you the ability to solve diseases? Wouldn't it give you the ability to build better computers and better houses and better cars and, and a better world if you had all that knowledge? See, I believe that God wants to empower humans, and I believe that God has been treating us like grown-ups from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And we are responsible for what we do, and we can make messes, and we have to clean them up, and he will give us wisdom to do that and, and, and all of that, but he wants us to learn. And so this stimulated me to create the Evolution 2.0 Prize yeah. because I started getting debates with people about this. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, I got in the world's largest atheist discussion board, and that ran for six or seven years, and that's a whole saga. And 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 I, I and I said, you know what? We need to like drive a stake in the ground. The central problem in this whole thing is where does the information come from? Where do you get information? We need a scientific theory of where you get information, and we don't have one. We know what it is. We know what codes are. We can analyze it to death, but we don't know how to create things that create it. Computer, dumb as a box of rocks. All it can do is garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you put in you know, is, is what's going to come out. Um, but cells are different. And so right now the price is at $3 million, and if you go to naturalcode.org, we have a specification, yeah. and we are saying, if if you can if you can generate a code without designing one without cheating, then just because you figured it out, I'll write you a check for a hundred thousand dollars. But if your discovery is defensively patentable, we will we will spend the money. We will get it patented. We will lock, nail that thing down, and when the patent is granted, we will write you a check for three million dollars to buy the rights and we will commercialize it, and we'll do something useful for humanity with it. And uh, the company I formed for this is called Natural Code, LLC. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and see, it's important that A, we have to recognize the questions that have not been answered yet. When, when science makes discoveries, all it really does is it, it provokes more questions. Right. Science does not answer its own questions. And so for that reason, science never manages to get rid of God. God has always refused to go away. God is staring us in the face, and proof is all the people that are jumping up and down saying, there is no God, there is no God. It's like, why are you having to say that so loud? Right? So then uh, on the other side, we have, to, we have to honor and recognize scientists. Because scientists, some of them are really trying to solve these problems. And they are really figuring out how evolution works. And they're figuring out how genomes get re-engineered. And these are important things. And we need to know these things. And we can't pit 
religion and science against each other as though they're enemies because they're not. Um, this whole thing of science versus religion is a big, it's a big made up story that Ken Ham and Richard Dawkins have been using to line their pockets for the last 20 years. And it's stupid and it's not helping. It is not helping. So it's a hundred thousand dollar prize. Has anyone tried to have they submitted anything so far? I got my first submission about two months ago. Yeah. And um, it, it was a ten thousand dollar prize on my website since two thousand nine, and I never got any submissions. But it was also kind of under the radar. But mm -hmm. lately, I've been you know I've been doing uh, interviews like this one, and I've been speaking at conferences and stuff, and people are coming out of the woodwork. And I had this uh, I had this uh, PhD student uh, in Houston, uh, William Sikema. He sent me a submission, and it's actually on the website. You can go look. Mm -hmm. Um, at naturalcode.org, you can go see what he did. And, you know, it probably only is like a fourth of the way to solving the problem, but it's a good start. Right. You know, and I really, I really do honor anybody that really wants to get in and, and try to solve this. What I don't have any patience for is anybody who wants to sit around and pretend that it's been solved. No, this hasn't been solved. And no, the Miller-Urey experiment in 1953 where they zapped something with electricity and got amino acids, they did not solve much of anything, right? And, you know, th there's stuff in biology books that just makes me cringe. Like, th they just make up some story and stick it in there. And then, you know, you you're, you're paying... Uh, you know, Richard Dawkins got on a radio program uh, on NPR once, and somebody asked him about the origin of life, and he said it was a happy chemical accident. What? This is the Oxford University professor of the public understanding of science? It's the public butchering of science. This is totally beneath an institution like Oxford to be saying things like that. Yeah. It's academically irresponsible. You're sending your kid to that school and paying $60,000 a year and they're teaching them that? <laughs> that pisses me off. So that's not education. That's propaganda. It's, it's irresponsible atheist propaganda is what it is. If you don't know, say you don't know. Right. But don't make up a story. So... How did someone win the hundred thousand? They may explain it again. Okay, you have to come up with an encoder that transmits a code to a decoder, and you need a two-layer code similar to like DNA. There's there's the four bases, but then they come in groups of three, and that gives you the genetic code, which you can look up in, in any biology book. And that would be analogous, for example, to the ASCII code where on is one and zero is off and then you have groups of seven and, and that gives you a letter of the alphabet in computer code. And that's like the simplest computer code. So in other words, I'm saying if you can make an encoder, a, a message and a decoder that is at least as sophisticated as the simplest codes that we can think of, if you can do that, and you can do it without cheating, then we'll write you the check. Hmm. Nobody's ever figured out how to do this. But I think it's, it's, it's the most simple un, and profound unanswered question in biology. So, so Jeremy, you'll relate to, you know, Richard Koch has a new book called Simplify. Uh, we did a star seminar a year ago and it was about simplification. Yeah. Instead of trying to solve the, the first cell, which is an outrageously complicated problem, right. let's, go to, let's go a step simpler. If we can solve origin of information, it's a much simpler problem. Yeah. It's not all of the problem, but it's really important. If we can solve origin of information, then I believe we, have, we will have made one of the 10 most important scientific discoveries of the 21st century. Yeah. 
it would be right up there with the discovery of DNA, with the discovery of mm. quantum mechanics, with the discovery of relativity, yeah. with the sequencing of the human genome. It would be that important. And so what I did was I put together, I gathered around a group of private equity investors and we funded this prize uh, and we're continuing to grow the fund, but right now we're at $3 million and we want to solve this problem. And then until the problem gets solved, nobody gets to pretend that it is solved because we need minds that are working on the problem, not propaganda machines. So who's most qualified, do you think, to crack this? Okay. Um, innovations always come from outsiders. Right. I remember your talk. I see the circle and I see the dot outside that circle. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Innovations come from outsiders. I don't think it's going to come from inside of biology. Hmm. Um, you know, Bill Gates did not come from the computer industry, and, and Fred Smith of FedEx did not come from the shipping industry, and Larry and Sergi, when they started Google, they had not come from the search engine industry, um, and, um, you, and, and Ray Kroc did not come from the restaurant industry, um, it, it, it's somebody, somebody is going to come with some completely different angle. Um, that, that is my prediction. I think 80% of the time, that's, that's how it works. Right. Any uh, guess on what industry you think it'll come from? It's, it's going to come from somebody who really, really, really wants to solve some other kind of a problem and when they've solved it they look back and they realize hey wait a minute i just figured out how to do this yeah um you know i don't know maybe they're trying to make toys for their kids or i, I mean i i i don't know i yeah. you know i i think uh, uh, truth is stranger than fiction <laughs> That's um, all I can say. So, what if you had a conversation with Watson? What would you What would you chat with him about? James Watson, yeah, who discovered DNA, yeah. Well, I would chide him for claiming that they had proven that just because they figured out uh, the the chemical structure of DNA. Um, that they had proved that there's uh, nothing but chemistry inside of cells because they never figured out where the information came from. And information is a separate thing from matter and energy. Mm -hmm. um, it's its own entity. And, um, you know, frankly, the, the problem with biology is it's been obsessed with chemistry um, for the last 60 or 100 years and you're not going to find you're not going to solve this problem in chemistry um it, it might even come from philosophy um maybe some philosopher will figure out how you solve this thing um or mathematics uh, that that would be another vote yeah i mean you talked about perry some of the people the most prominent scientists that would disagree with you and have completely opposite views richard Dawk you know, Dawkins, Bill Nye, who are some of the prominent figures that would actually agree with you? I mean, you, um, you mentioned James Shapiro. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'd, I, would be, I would be pretty simpatico with, um, with uh, Francis Collins, uh, who he wrote a book called The Language of God, and he was a pioneer in the Human Genome Project. I think, I think Craig Venter... Um, would agree with a lot of what I'm saying. I don't know if he agree with all of it, but he, he's the guy um, who was, he was the compadre on the Human Genome Project. He started the privately held company that was sequencing the human genome back in the early 2000s. Certainly there would be some um, with that. And, uh, you know, another, another guy that I really like is Dennis Noble. Mm -hmm. And he's a very respected um, uh, biologist in the UK, and he's the chair of a major society um, in, in the biological sciences. And, you know, he said something really interesting. He said every pillar 
of the modern uh, neo-Darwinian synthesis has been proven wrong. Hmm. And if you, if you go look up systems biology, systems biology is a view of biology that everything is systems. That it's like systems all the way down. I think that's, that's where we're headed. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say that um, it's going to take... So bi biology is most definitely not the highest paid profession in science and technology. If we fixed the conception of evolution, it would become the highest paid um, discipline in the sciences. And here's, here's what's going on. Biology has bought into a really dumbed down paradigm. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what the process that got us here. And so they are consistently underestimated. You know, we finally got rid of the junk DNA hypothesis only three years ago. They should have ditched that thing the day it came out in the 1970s. But it, it was with us for 40 years, okay? Mm -hmm. We are going to need the absolute smartest people on the planet to figure, to decode the human genome. So you understand, when we say we decoded the human genome, all we did was identify like 30,000 genes. Right. Okay, we still did not understand 95% of the genome. Okay, so when that happened, that was only like the first 5%. It's going to take the smartest people on the planet working for the next 300 years to decode this thing. Yeah. And you can, I mean, dude, like write this on a, like put it in a cap, a time capsule or something that I said this. Okay. We have no idea how deep this mystery goes. Mm -hmm. We are going to need people from big data. We're going to need people from linguistics. We're going to need people in the highest levels of mm -hmm. mathematics. We have no idea how sophisticated this thing is. It's incredibly amazing, okay? And we're gonna be unraveling this mystery for a long time. When we begin to really get how amazing this is, we are gonna start making bigger and bigger breakthroughs because we're gonna bring insights from other professions. This is a very interdisciplinary question. You need the mathematician and the linguist and the chemist and the biologist and the microscope guy and the mm -hmm. telescope guy. You need the astronomer. You need the physics. You need the electrical engineer. You know, you might even find the marketers and the business people are useful because I think business is a lot like biology. Yeah. Okay, like all the decisions you have to, you know, we're you're trying to get a company to run and you're trying to get all the departments to line up and everything. Gee, I, I don't know. Is that sort of like a multicellular organism? You know, how do you know, how does a how does a mouse, you know, all all the cells in the mouse are cooperating. They're all on the same page. They're all doing their job. Do you know what an astonishing feat that is? Right? Yeah, for sure. You know, I know, you know, Perry, that you're on some type of right track when you get a seven paragraph one star review on Amazon. Um, so, so I was looking. It's the battle of the one stars versus the five stars. You, you will quickly see. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you're striking a nerve there, you know, uh, yeah. on both sides. And um, so, I wanted to talk about that for a second. Um, John Murtis left this seven paragraph. You probably read it. One star review. And so I want you to address some of that. Um, you know, because obviously okay, so, you're, you're not going to respond with a seven paragraph answer, but we could respond well, here. And I think it'd be interesting. And he said, you know, I'll have you respond, but I'll just read it so the audience can kind of hear a little bit what yeah. he said. Uh, his sure. most egregious, talking about you, and I, I couldn't copy the whole thing or nor will I read the whole thing, but his most egregious mistake is to compare DNA to computer code. Sure, there are similarities, but a gene encodes a protein, and he kind of goes on about that, and then, and then he talks about it's a reintroduction of 
Lamarckism, Lamarckism and suffers the same problems that destroyed Lamarckism as an evolutionary theory, blah, blah, blah. And I like his quote at the end, regardless of it, because, you know, if it's about your book or not. But Dorothy Parker once said, this is not a novel to be tossed aside lightly. It should be thrown with great force. <laughs> so, Well, Mr. Murtis, yeah. I am glad to have pissed you off. Yeah. So, so I have two things to say about that. Yeah. Mr. Murtis needs to go Google, go to Google Scholar, mm -hmm. scholar.google.com and type in epigenetics mm -hmm. and Lamarck. Type in both of those things and go read the thousands of papers that have vindicated Lamarck. Lamarck is a scientist 200 years ago who said that offspring inherit acquired traits from their parents. Lamarck was laughed out of biology by the neo-Darwinists in the 30s and 40s. And Lamarck is back because Lamarck was right. And this guy writing this review is not even up on the latest biology. He's still stuck in the 70s. Okay, that's the first comment. Yeah. The second comment is anybody who tells you DNA is a code understands neither DNA nor code. It is a matter of definition, okay? You go to Wikipedia or any biology book, there is a genetic coding table. A X codes for Y. AAA codes for glycine. GGG, or lysine. GGG codes for glycine. And right. you go down the, okay? It's just like, or go look up ASCII, A-S-C-I-I. -I. 10001 codes for A and 10010 codes for B. It's a code. Okay? Anybody that tells you it's not a code, they have no idea what they're talking about. And they're setting us back 50 years. Watson and Crick won the Nobel Prize for figuring out A, that is, there's a helical structure with these bases, and B, that it is a code. Okay? Mm -hmm. Totally doesn't know what they're talking about. Now, that guy says something else that's not true. Perry doesn't cite any experiments. Well, the guy just proved he didn't actually read the book. So, to date, as of October 27, 2015, none of the one-star reviews actually read the book. Jerry Coyne, famous atheist at University of Chicago, wrote a scathing review of my book, admits in his review he did not read the book. I dare people just read the book. Right. Now, here's the interesting thing. The five-star reviews, most of them did read the book, which takes a lot longer. It takes a lot longer to actually read a book. So, if you want to re not read the book and criticize it, some people are going to do that. But the truth is the truth. Right. Well, thank you. I had to, you know... I'm not that um, in your face, but I have to bring someone else who is in your face to bring, represent the in your face people. So bring it on. Yeah. Look, yeah. I knew when I wrote this book, I'm going to piss off a bunch of. <laughs> that's okay? what we, that's a disclaimer. Look, yeah. Look, frankly, look, I got in 2005, I got drug onto infidels, which at the time was the world's largest atheist website. And they had the, this, this discussion forum. And I'm like, I, I have breakfast with my buddy, John. I'm like, John, I totally do not want to do this. Like, oh, man, John. Like, John, do I have to do this? He's like, Perry, I think you I think you have to do this. It's like, Perry, I think God's got a sense of humor. You know, I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know? And, and here I am, like, trying to have a pissing match with a skunk. And you know what? That thing went on for seven years. And... They took it down, and they won't repost it, and they don't want anybody to see it. Hmm. Okay, and you know if you can go, people can go look up the lady that owned frdb.org or Free Ratio, whatever website it was. I've got a page. I've got a screenshot from archive.org. You can go to cosmicfingerprints.com/infidels. You can read the whole story. But you know what? I got thick skin, and I'm used to it. Right. Okay. And, you know, the real problem with these people is the science is not on their side. And um, so they feel threatened. It's like, well, 
you know, and I, you know, read the book, disagree with it. Read the book, agree with it. Decide for yourself. Right. right. Because, you know, uh, people are smart. People can figure this stuff out. You yeah. know, Perry, I appreciate your time. I have one last question, two last questions. Where, first, where should we point people towards? Where should they check out to find out more? Um, if you go to CosmicFingerprints.com, you can get three free chapters. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and you get on my email list. Um, you can go to Amazon and buy Evolution 2.0. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, but I, I just want to say this. You know, I'm a city kid. I live in Chicago. I grew up in the city. I don't, you know, and like evolution is like a city kid kind of subject to talk about mostly. City slickers do not know how amazing nature is. Okay. And once in a while you'll be on vacation and you'll be climbing through a canyon or you'll get a sunset or you'll be at the ocean and you'll like, it'll hit you like a wave. Right. Like, oh my goodness, nature is amazing. Or maybe you'll be in western Nebraska on a starry night and you'll look up and you'll see all those stars which you don't see in the city. You know, Jeremy, you and I both live in Chicago. It's called pollution, right? Yeah. Pollution, like, uh, okay, city people become disconnected with nature, okay? And I think this is what like we start to believe urban legends about how nature got to be the way it is in their complete misrepresentations you know so a you know if you're cynical about nature or if you think nature is a series of random accidents i think you need to get a vacation i think it's your life and your office and your traffic that's a series of random accidents not nature mm -hmm. and secondly i've really done my best to 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 give people a look under the hood from an engineer's point of view what is going on inside a cell so that even city people that went and got a college education and maybe they got a physics degree or maybe they got a chemistry degree or or they work in engineering or they work in business or they do pay-per-click advertising that they can start to see oh my goodness this is so much more amazing than i ever realized this is so much bigger than us yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing and, and sticking your neck out uh, with all this, um, even though I just like listening to it and and uh, <laughs> and, and hearing, <laughs> you know, your thoughts and um, and the research and, and how much of a deep dive you went into it. Um, so my last question is, does God exist? Yeah, I think I think it's obvious. I think. Everybody knows God exists, and you have to tell yourself a very convoluted, complicated story in order to convince yourself otherwise. You know what it's like, Jeremy? Did you ever, you ever read Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, and it sure. opens with a story about um, like a bunch of um, art gallery people stand around a circle and they look at this thing and a bunch of them go, ah, I think this is fake. And, and, and then like all these scientists and researchers prove that it's real. But then later they do some more research and they figure out, yeah, it's actually fake. Right. That the blink reaction was originally correct. Right, right. Okay, you know what? Every human being actually has a blink reaction that there is a really big something. Mm -hmm. Everybody has that. Okay, and you can tell yourself a very sophisticated story. And yes, you can convince yourself that there is no God. And I don't disagree. There's a bunch of people that they are convinced there isn't a God. And I don't think you're lying. Okay, but what I'm saying is you bought into a story. And it's a very complicated Rube Goldberg machine kind of a story. And it's the wrong story. Yeah. So love it, Perry. As always, it's always fantastic chatting. And um, 
you know, I could keep going on and on, but um, I'm going to leave it right there. So uh, I appreciate your time. Everyone check out CosmicFingerprints.com. Check out Perry's book, Evolution 2.0. I'm never disappointed with your book. So thank you, Perry. Hey, thank you for a really like digging deep, you know, not afraid to pry open any little nook or cranny kind of interview. It's a really good yeah. job yeah. that you did here. Thank you, Perry. Thank you. I appreciate it. Peach if you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand